Moses talks about a wide range of, of subjects, a wide range of subjects. Before we get into these chapters, though, I want to really quickly recap chapters 14 through 18 for those that are taking notes and um, studying again. I want to uh, also recommend a book to help you if you want to go back to Deuteronomy. The book is by a brother in Christ by the name of Aubrey Johnson. It's called Renewing Your Spiritual Life. It's a very, uh, very easy read. And it uh, goes through the book of Deuteronomy uh, in, a, in a, for lack of a better term, a very practical way, okay? A very uh, simple way. Um, it's not a, a verse by verse study or really uh, an in-depth uh, study uh, of the book of Deuteronomy, but it does focus on certain principles um, found in the book of Deuteronomy, okay? Uh, renewing your spiritual life, Aubrey Johnson. Uh, kind of a little companion to our studies, you know. Uh, but last week we talked about, uh, and plus it's pretty economical, it was about six dollars. <laughs> huh? Oh, I think Amazon. I had it many years, I've had it for a, a lot of years, but no, it's, I think it's still on Amazon. So I think that's what it is. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 14 through 18, we entitled that very quickly, Belonging to God should change our way of thinking, if you guys remember that. And so we looked at uh, chapter 14 and we saw that Moses in this um, really collection of sermons, he talked about uh, diet. Remember, he was talking about uh, holiness. Don't uh, focus so much on the, the subjects without understanding the point that God is making. It was about holiness and distinction and the, the way it ought to affect uh, how they ate and what they ate. And so God, he was over that. He cared about those. He could, was concerned about those. He gave them commandments about the dietary issues to, to show them about the importance of holiness. We talked about how God in, in chapter 16 described uh, certain uh, assemblies that, they were, that the men were required to partake three times a year, and how that is, again, a reflection on uh, you and I as Christians in the assembly, uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. We looked at things like uh, chapter 15, uh, what God said about uh, debts and forgiveness of debts, um, greed. God looked at uh, greed and how they should um, look at uh, material things and uh, financial wealth in relation to their relationships. Uh, we looked at chapter 16 and we're all the way to chapter 18 where God described citizenship and justice and righteousness. We're going to look at that again today, justice, uh, how they were to be uh, impartial concerning certain matters. God gave them stipulations in these same chapters about uh, the kingship. He gave them stipulations in chapters 14 through 18 about the priesthood. He gave them stipulations about uh, prophets in chapter 18. So God was distinguishing them from all other nations and all other, from pagan uh, worship, showing them that because they belonged to him, that they were holy and they were to regard themselves in that manner. And when they looked at themselves uh, as God's people, that it would change their way of thinking and then it would change their behavior. Again, so in chapter 19 through 25, it's going to take us a couple of weeks to look at this. He talks about issues regarding integrity in everyday life. That's how we wanted to head that because uh, character is, is what's uh, being described. Again, there are various subjects that are mentioned and, and very uh, nuances concerning life that uh, the Holy Spirit inspired Moses to touch on right before they entered into the land. But again, understand that it has to do with integrity. Uh, one could even uh, entitle it, Love 
one's neighbor, love for one's neighbor. This is what uh, these particular chapters uh, denote. So let's look at, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 19. Let's read some of the verses here. Uh, get some. Deuteronomy chapter 19. Let's read some verses here because in verses 1 through 13, uh, he talks about once they enter into the land, um, recognizing property boundaries. Wow, we could use that <laughs> even today, couldn't we? There are a lot of principles even to that. You know, uh, God, when we learn uh, about boundaries, what we learn about, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, limitations we learn from God. And that what the Apostle Paul was talking about in the book of Acts when he talked about how God has given men certain boundaries. You know, the land on, of the earth goes what? Only so far. The seas and the great uh, bodies of water, God is the one who has established how far they go. You know, and it's the same thing with man. Man ought to... As, the great Clint Eastwood says man ought to know his limitations, he ought to know his boundaries, right? Because God is a God of boundaries. So when they come into the land, God is telling them that the boundary that he set to recognize them. The world could use principles <clears throat> to live by and to govern them in this manner today because a lot of times a lot of conflict and a lot of um, dissension comes because folk don't, want to recognize the boundaries that have been set by God and boundaries that have been set uh, by individuals from on a personal level, okay? So this is what he talks about, chapter 19, verse number one. Uh, it says, when the Lord your God has cut off the nations whose land the Lord your God is giving you, and you have disposed them and settled in their towns and in their houses, you shall set apart three cities in the land that the Lord your God is giving you to possess. You shall calculate the distances and divide into three regions the land that the Lord your God gives you as a possession so that any homicide can flee to one of them. Okay, so we, if you look at uh, other uh, passages of scripture in the Pentateuch, you'll find that God goes through more in depth about the cities of refuge, okay? Um, but this is what's being mentioned here, verse four. Now this is the case of a homicide who might flee there and live, that is someone who has killed another person unintentionally. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I lost my place. When the two had not been at enmity before. Suppose someone goes into the forest with another to cut wood and when one of them swings the ax to cut down a tree, the head slips from the handle and strikes the other person who then dies and may flee to one of these cities and live. But if, the distance is, but if the distance is too great, the avenger of the blood and hot anger might pursue and overtake and put the killer to death, although a death sentence was not deserved since the two had not been at enmity before. Therefore, I command you, you shall set apart three cities. So these are the cities of refuge that are being described, okay? Verse 8 says, if the Lord your God enlarges your territory as he swore to your ancestors, and he will give you all the land that he promised your ancestors to give you, provide you diligently observe this, provided you diligently observe this entire commandment that I command you today by loving the Lord your God and walking always in his ways, then you shall add three more cities to these three. So the blood of an innocent person may not be shed in the land that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, thereby bringing blood guilt upon you. But if someone at enmity with another lies in wait and attacks and takes the life of that person and flees into one of these cities, then the elders of the, ki of the killer's city shall sin to have the culprit taken from there and handed over to the avenger of blood and to be put to death. Show no pity and sh you shall purge the guilt of innocent blood from Israel so that it may go well with you, okay? So that has to do with, of course, cities of refuge. It has to do with um, cities and boundaries. Uh, verses 14 um, talks more specifically about the boundaries. Look at verse 14, it says, you must not move your neighbor's boundary marker. 
set up by former generations on the property that will be allotted to you in the land that the Lord your God has given you to possess. So God, again, is talking about integrity, okay? So even in terms of things like uh, unintentional murder, things that have to do with the boundaries that are set, things that have to do with the cities of refuge, all of these things, they were to show what integrity and character. Even in terms, when you think about death, they're not all the same. Even in our society, we have degrees of murder, okay? To treat uh, someone the same as another, an individual who may have killed someone with malice and intentional uh, hatred and disdain is not the same as one who kills um, unintentionally. And, and that's wisdom and integrity that they were supposed to have then, that's the integrity they were supposed to have now. Again, God talks about cities of refuge for those um, that are involved in these things. God talks about uh, markers and boundaries that uh, have been established from of old. They were not to remove those, okay? God talks about in verses 14 through 21, uh, 15 through 21, rules for testimony. You know, we uh, look at passages like, again, Matthew chapter 18, where God in the church talks about the importance of of not taking the word of one individual, you know, uh, really um, confirming testimony that is given, giving evidence uh, to certain things that are, are, um, that are argued. This is what is conveyed in these verses. Look at verses 15 and following. It says, a single witness shall not suffice to convict a person of any crime or wrongdoing in connection with any offense that may be committed, okay? So they had to have the testimony of two or three witnesses. Again, that's very reminiscent of Matthew chapter 18. Uh, that's reminiscent of Paul's words to Timothy in terms of an elder never accept the, an accusation uh, against an elder except on the testimony of what, two or three witnesses. So God wants things to be confirmed. He wants things to be confirmed. And a, a sound judicial system, of course, uh, believes in credible evidence, <laughs> credible evidence. Okay, verse 16, the latter part of verse 15 says, only on the evidence of two or three witnesses shall a charge be sustained. If a malicious witness comes forward to accuse someone of wrongdoing, then both parties to the dispute shall appear before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who are in office in those days and the judges shall make a thorough inquiry if the witness is a false witness having testified falsely against another then you shall do the false witness just as the false witness has meant to do to the other so you shall purge the evil from your midst the rest shall hear and be afraid and a crime such as this shall never again be committed among you show no pity Life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. So that's what now the Jews, the Pharisees we know, took that. They ran with it. You know, they tried to apply that in every manner. What you do to me, I'm going to do to you. That's not the intent here. God is, is establishing justice. And again, any society that deems itself civilized ought to uh, embody these principles. Again, there ought to be truthful evidence and a witness ought to have integrity and character and that ought to be established and even in our judicial system the credibility of a witness is important at least it's supposed to be and this is what God is talking about here God is really describing the really the nature of some men and how some individuals uh, with malice in their heart doesn't care what happens to an individual if that person is innocent, if that person has uh, committed no crime, if they have hatred and disdain, uh, they will do whatever it takes to, to cause harm to a person. And we see that even today, okay? But God is uh, telling Israel that they needed to show integrity. They needed to be part of integrity as being impartial. And we even, again, look at our society and it's not one that can always be described as an impartial and a fair judicial system. Sometimes we take the words of folk who are of so-called nobility or so-called 
high standing over the words of an, in, an individual, not because the person has uh, established a foundation of character or integrity, but it may be based on wealth, it may be based on money, it may be based on the type of job that they have. God said that that is the way that man does things, but in terms of his people, you know, that's not the way that they were to conduct themselves, and it should be that way. Now again, in our world, in our country, for us to expect men who are not necessarily guided to embody godly principles is not realistic, but it ought to be realistic where in the church. There ought to be fairness, there ought to be impartiality, there ought to be justice in the church, no matter uh, who it is, you know, from preacher to the elders to whomever it is, there ought to be fairness. And, and folk ought to feel and believe in the church that there is, is justice and balance and equity in the church. Okay, and Jesus establishes this again in the New Testament scriptures. Go ahead, Sally. No. Right. 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 But that's not always the case even in the church either, is it? Because sometimes in the church we, we look at people as being more important and, and being uh, of a greater uh, standing than someone else based upon human things, based upon how much money a person may have or again, what so-called so-called position that they hold, and that's not supposed to be. And then when you, you see these things happening and these injustices in the Lord's church, then it affects the faith of individuals. God wants there to be impartiality and justice all the way through in the church so that all of us will do what? Stand in fear of God's word. And none of us will think that we are what above the word of God. And it ought to be that way in the Lord's church, and we ought to be distinct and distinguish ourselves in this manner from the world, and yes, even in a, a, a society that is deemed to be democratic and uh, built on fairness. Go ahead, Sal. He is not. He's not, but sometimes, sometimes his people are. Yeah, and, and that's one of the things that that again, one of those foundational things that has to be established in the Lord's church all over again. We have to establish that. You know, remember when the Apostle Paul confronted Peter to his face in the book of Galatians? Remember Paul, now here's an apostle, and Paul says Peter was not acting in accordance to faith, so what did Paul do? He opposed Peter to his face. Paul was not trying to embarrass Peter. Paul was not trying to show Peter up. He was not trying to act as if he was a greater apostle. Paul was doing it for the benefit of what? Of the whole church, all of the individuals that were impacted and influenced by the leadership of Peter. So Paul says, I oppose him to his face because he was not acting in accordance to faith. And, and he even led Barnabas astray. And so Paul had to, and that's how the church ought to be. You know, we, we shouldn't think that an individual is too great for us to approach them and to correct them you know, and to uh, rebuke them because no one is above rebuke in the Lord's church. No one. No one. You know, we're all, uh, we're all the same. We're supposed to be regarded as the same in the eyes of one another. But most certainly, as Sally is saying, God certainly sees all of his children as the same. God doesn't care if you're a preacher. <clears throat> he doesn't care if you're an elder. He doesn't care how much money you have. He doesn't care about any of that. You know, God is a God of justice. And so this is one uh, what God was talking to them about integrity in everyday life. You know, loving their neighbor was, was really all about, okay? Uh, chapter 20, if you look at chapter 20, there are uh, issues involving war, laws that uh, God gave them concerning war, okay? Not only were they about to go into a land where it was predominantly uh, going to be 
unoccupied, but they, they still had to go and deal with certain nations and have war with certain nations. God was giving them commandments on uh, later down the road, uh, years later, how to conduct themselves in war. So when you look at chapter 20, you find that first God stipulates that if they were faithful, if they trusted in him, that God would do what? That he would fight the battles. They were his people, and God was going to take care of them, that the enemies would not triumph over them. This is what you see in the opening verses of uh, Deuteronomy chapter 20. And then God gives other laws. Let's read a few of the verses here, okay? Chapter 20, verse 1 says, When you go out to war against your enemies and see horses and chariots, an army larger than your own, you shall not be afraid of them. For the Lord your God is with you, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Okay? So then God gives stipulations about war, about individuals that were newly married, those who were establishing certain what we would call businesses and, and things of that nature. God, those that were afraid. Remember when uh, Gideon was fighting the war for Israel and God told those that were afraid, God allowed them to go home. Well, that was a principle that God held among the Israelites really throughout their existence. Those that were afraid, God looked at that and God said, okay, those that are afraid, they can stay home, okay? So there were stipulations to war. Remember, Deuteronomy is a book that shows the meticulous nature of God and how God gave them uh, provisions for everyday life. There was not an area of life that they could look at and say, well, God, what about this? God, what about that? God had taken care of it. Now, today, ungodly men look at it and say that, okay, look at all of these things, all of these miscellaneous and non-important things. These, uh, God is uh, micromanaging God. No, God is showing us the same thing that Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 1, that his divine power is what? Given us everything needed for life and godliness. It, it's reminiscent of Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, all scriptures God breathed and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be proficient, equipped for every good work, thoroughly furnished, that the man is complete in every aspect of life. That's what the book of Deuteronomy shows us, is that God handles every aspect of life, and that's what we ought to understand in the Lord's church today. There's never a time, now we may not know the answer presently, but don't say that the answer is not found in scripture. Don't say that. Somebody get Philippians chapter uh, 3 verse 16 for me and read that. Philippians 3 16. Read that for us when you get it. Verses 15 and 16. A little loud, please. That those of us men who are mature be of the same mind. And to think differently about anything, this too God will reveal to you. Only love let us hold fast for our heaven. God has all of it covered. We may not know the answer. We may not, we may disagree on what it is, but don't say that it's not in God's word. We just have to keep studying God's word because the answers are there. The answers are there. And so we have to, as Paul says, let those of us who are mature, I see you, Sally, those who are mature, he's talking about from a, a, a scriptural standpoint, individuals who have, have reached a, a certain goal in terms of what the word of God says, that those of us who are mature, those of us who have, who have found the answers in God's word, be of the same mind. Agree with what God's word says. And if you think differently about anything, this too God will reveal to you, only let us hold on to what we have already attained. But the answers are there for life. Go ahead. Yeah. 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 
that then, then, you know, when you consider again that every issue God gave them answers to every issue of life, they could walk with integrity and in character in everyday life. God wanted them to understand that, okay? So even in terms of war, look at what some of the things that God says about war, okay? Before you engage in battle, the priest shall come forward and speak to the troops and shall say to them, Hear, O Israel, today you are drawing near to do battle against your enemies. Do not lose heart or be afraid or panic or be in dread of them. For it is the Lord your God who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you victory. So God had already established victory for them. Then the officials shall address the troops, saying, Has anyone built a new house but not dedicated it? He should go back to his house, or he might die in the battle or another dedicated. Has anyone planted a vineyard but not yet enjoyed its fruit? He should go back to his house, or he might die in battle and another be first to enjoy the, its fruit. Now, uh, just look at that, how powerful that is. And God is, is showing how merciful and how loving and how caring he is, okay? And God can be that way, why? Because God was the one who was going to fight the battle in the first place. He was the one that was going to give the victory in the first place. And I want you to consider even what we just read from Philippians chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. A man who was not prepared to fight this particular war did not mean that later on God did not mature him to later be ready to fight another war. I might have been afraid, Paul, when we fought this particular group of people, but God was working with me, building me up with integrity and character so that the next time I could redeem myself and do what? And fight the next battle. That's the mercy and the love of God. That's powerful. Powerful when you think about it, okay? Look at verse um, number six. Has anyone planted a vineyard but not enjoyed his fruit? He shall go back to his house. Verse seven. Has anyone became engaged to a woman but not yet married her? He should go back to his house or he might die in the battle and another marry her. The officials shall continue to address the troops saying, is anyone afraid or disheartened? He should go back to his house or he might cause the heart of his comrades to melt like his own. When the officials have finished addressing the troops, then the commander shall take charge of them. So God was looking and providing for them in every way. Any questions, any comments so far about that? Anything? Anybody? Yes, sir. I was just thinking about Brother Ryan, how me and my dad asked conversations about scripture. He talked about it, okay, here. And he used to always bring up the words that was war and pieces. He used to say that, you know, when we are reading God's word, that we have to even understand, too, that there's a certain kind of order and pieces that he expects us to say in our thoughts. First Corinthians <clears throat> chapter 12, 13 and 14, when Paul was describing and talking about behavior in the church, he's talking about to first century Christians, but us to it as well. We don't have those miraculous gifts, but Paul was giving uh, inspired stipulations on those miraculous gifts. And that's where he talks about, you know, God being a God of what order and that everything that we do in the Lord's church must be done what decently and in order. 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, without a doubt, integrity and in character. And as men growing in these things, as Christians growing in these things, as, as God's people growing in integrity and in character. And God giving us room to do so. Giving us room to do so. Men might not always do that. You know, men might judge you for what you lack and for where you are not right now. But God is a God of mercy and of patience and of love. God will most certainly, you know, if we're uh, striving to do his will, if we're moving incrementally, God is always but faithful enough to, to be merciful to us. This is what he's showing here. But notice as well that God cares so deeply about the men that were going out to war. The men that were going out to war. Again, and there's principles for us 
regard to the Lord's church too because we are in a spiritual battle. But again, look at what God was saying. God was telling men, okay, if you're at this point, you're fearful, go home. Go home for yourself. Not only that, but for those that you might uh, really uh, kind of infest with fear. <laughs> you know, uh, and that's one thing we have to understand, that our behavior, our behavior can impact other people. Our bad behavior can impact other people. You know, just in the same way that our, our good behavior and our good morals can impact and affect people in a good way. We, we have to remember that, how we are, it doesn't mean that, that we're going to be perfect because none of us are going to live a flawless, perfect, sinless life. It just doesn't exist. The person does not exist. Christ Jesus is the only one that can be attributed to be tempted in all points yet without sin. But we're going to fail, we're going to uh, fall. Jesus says in Matthew 18, woe to the individual who intentionally and maliciously at times and sometimes um, very carelessly cause others to stumble. Okay, uh, just like in a natural war, this Christian war, this Christian battle that we're engaged in, it takes courage, it, it takes uh, faith, it takes focus, it takes a, a willingness in certain ways to die. And the last thing that a person who has dedicated himself or herself to, to doing battle for the Lord, the last thing that they need is for someone to do what? To, to uh, intentionally discourage them, to, to uh, say things or to do things for the purpose of melting that person's heart in fear. This is what God was dealing with. He says, just stay home. Stay home until uh, perhaps the next uh, war, and then you are built up. And so there were stipulations made about that. In chapter 21, God uh, talked about uh, the rights of various people. We'll probably end with this chapter. For example, again, God touches on murders. Again, chapters, chapter 21, verses 1 through 9. These, these have to do with what we could probably term as unsolved mysteries, unsolved murders. Um, God describes it. If in the land that the Lord your God is giving you to possess, a body is found lying in open country, and it is not known who struck the person down, then your elders and your judges shall come out to measure the distance, distances to the towns that are near the body. The elders of the town nearest the body shall take a heifer that has never been worked, one that has not pulled in, that has not pulled in the yoke. The elders of that town shall bring the heifer down to a weighty with running water, which is neither plowed nor sown, and shall break the heifer's neck there in the weighty. Then the priests, the sons of Levi, shall come forward, for the Lord your God has chosen them to minister to him and to pronounce blessings in the name of the Lord, and by their decision all cases of dispute and assault shall be settled. All the elders of that town nearest the body shall wash their hands over the heifer whose neck was broken in the weighty, and they shall declare, Our hands did not shed this blood, nor were we witnesses to it. Absolve, O Lord, your people Israel, whom you redeemed. Do not let the guilt of innocent blood remain in the midst of your people Israel. Then they will be absolved of blood guilt. So you shall purge the guilt of innocent blood from your midst because you must do what is right in the sight of the Lord. Now what, we're going to talk about this a little bit more next week. But what, what principles do you see here? What um, matters of integrity uh, is God trying to implement among the people? What, for what purpose do you believe uh, biblically these things were given to them? Okay. First of all, God wants to establish among these particular leaders, whether it was the Levites and priests or whether it was the elders, that they were supposed to uh, show a care and a concern for this uh, kinsfolk or this uh, particular individual that had fallen. Okay, this person had been murdered, they had been killed, and, and 
No one at the time knew who killed this person, okay? But God is showing Israel that he cared. That God, it, that it mattered to him. And so his leaders were supposed to first and foremost exemplify that they cared. Then they, they had to declare that through their ruling, they were guiltless in terms of this person's blood. So they had to show that they cared. They had to pronounce that their judgments, again, were impartial and that, that this death was not caused based upon some unfair ruling or some unjust act of their own. They had to acknowledge that they were not guilty of this person's blood. Okay? Some of the things that you see erroneously, but you see when Jesus is being crucified with the um, Pharisees and the religious leaders tried to do. They tried to excuse themselves of, of the guilt for murdering the Lord Jesus. But Jesus is talking to, to these individuals about a, a murder that was unsolved and how leaders are supposed to, to conduct themselves, okay? And so he talks about, uh, in these verses, having the heart of God and displaying this, this the heart of God that show concern and care. Could you imagine that? Coming across someone who had been struck by another, that person that's run off, uh, left this person in this state, and then someone who was uh, guiltless comes across this individual and they see, you know, and they, uh, it's, it's evident and obvious that this person's life has been taken. So the elders and, and the Levites are called and they look at, uh, what remains, and they have to, again, show a concern and a care. We have a tendency as uh, human beings that if it's not us, if it's not our family, then, then it, it doesn't impact or it affect me uh, too deeply. But God will be used to show how God deems things and how God cares for, for every one of us. Uh, and even if the person that murdered this individual was not known, you know, God, God still wanted them to, to handle it in a proper manner, with integrity and with love and with concern, not only for the person that was struck, but also, again, for the individual's family. <clears throat> okay? Uh, we're going to stop right there. Any questions, any comments? We're going to talk about this, these particular verses more next week. Any questions, any comments before we uh, close out in prayer? Again, study chapters 19 to 25 and more. We're going to look at some more things that pertain to, uh, to neighbors. He talks about uh, marrying individuals who uh, were made captives uh, through war. God talks about that. He talks about the uh, rights of the firstborn son. We're going to look at that next week. Rights of parents and in terms of children honoring parents. Whether you, what did God command them to do with rebellious uh, children? Children that uh, parents raised properly and parents discipline properly, because it's not always a matter of parents not doing right and raising their children when a child rebels. That's not what the Bible teaches. God is describing here that everything was done by those parents, and yet this child still rebelled. What do you do in terms of that? So we're going to look at those things next week as well as uh, chapters 22 through 25. Okay, with that, let's go to God in prayer. Gracious God and Father, again, we thank you and we praise you for this time that we have been able to spend with one another. We thank you for all of your blessings, but above all, we thank you for your Son, uh, whom is made, who has made all blessings possible for us uh, in your kingdom. We are so grateful, Lord, and we're thankful for what we were able to study today. We're so thankful that we're able to look uh, at, at how you uh, dealt with your people long ago, Israel, Lord, and the principles in terms of holiness and establishing integrity, Lord, and learn lessons that are able to uh, help us today, give us principles for living today, dear Father, that we're able to see your glory in the Old Testament and how uh, these things ring true and powerful in the New Testament scriptures, Lord, and how they're able to, to distinguish us as your children and to help us to, to love one another in the proper manner. We pray that all that we've studied, Lord, is important to us, that it's real to us, that we are intent, Lord, on 
implementing these things in our lives more and more, excelling in these things that have to do with integrity and character and loving for one another. We pray that as we uh, go into our worship, Lord, that our minds are focused and receptive and that we are excited about worship. We pray for those that may be making their way here, that you will watch them in mind and body and in heart. We pray for those that would be here but could not, those who could and would not, Lord, that, that things will uh, be worked in their lives so that at the next appointed time, if it's your will, that they will come, Lord, and be a part of them. just all of the glorious feast that you have prepared for those uh, that you love and those who love you. All of these things we pray and ask in Jesus' glorious name. Amen. Guys,